Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to Collider Mailbag, the all mailbag show here on Collider Video, where all we do is take your mailbag questions. My name is John Campy. I'm your host for uh, Mailbag, and I'm joined once again, as I was yesterday, by Wendy Lee. Wendy, thanks for being here. Thanks again for having me back. And uh, having you on yesterday was really, it's a lot easier for me to do these shows <laughs> when I have somebody else with me. Uh, but listen, for those of you who don't know, Mailbag is a much more laid back, relaxed show that we do around here on Collider Video. And how do you get your questions on our show? Simple. You email us at collidervideo at gmail.com. Now, maybe you'll see your question pop up Monday through Friday on Movie Talk. Maybe you'll see it on the weekends here on Mailbag. Uh, we get like over a thousand email questions a week, so maybe you won't see it at all, but we'll do our best to get your question on the air. So with all that out of the way, let's get into the first question. Wendy, what do we got? All right. The first one comes from Brian Kay, who writes, I recently got my copy of How Star Wars Conquered the Universe, and I'm loving it so far. Thanks for the recommendation. My question is, when you do your Star Wars commentary on A New Hope, Empire, and Jedi, will you do the original version or the special editions? Love watching the VHS. Yes, VHS versions. But I was wondering which you were going to be commentating on. Love to hear your plan... And can't wait to watch them no matter what the version is. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, for those of you who don't know what he's talking about, uh, we've been doing, we talked about this on mo on uh, Mailbag yesterday. Me, Mark, Christian, and Schnepp have been doing these commentaries where we watch all the Star Wars films. We've gotten through the three prequels so far, one at a time. And we just keep a camera on us and we talk through it. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, we've had a great time. And now we're getting into the original trilogy, Star Wars, Empire, and Return of the Jedi, or as I call them, the only three true Star Wars movies. Now, that being said... We, um, we are going to be doing the special edition. And the reason we're doing the special edition is because really that's all that exists, really. Um, because you can't find DVDs out there. And, and if you can, they're very, very, very rare. Most people who own Star Wars, Empire, Return of the Jedi have the special edition. That's just what they are now. So, I mean, we could do the VHS one, but then nobody could watch the commentary with mm -hmm. us because only people who had the VHS could follow mm -hmm. along. So the ones we are going to be doing are the special editions. You know, my aunt still has the VHSs. Really? I might kidnap them when I go back to Florida. I think my buddy Ryan still has them, but I do not have a VHS player or oh. anything I'd be able to play them on. So <laughs> they would be kind of useless You'd to me. You'd be like Felicity and Arrow and just play it on And just wave it in front of my laptop <laughs> and magically it plays. Yeah. But do you think it'll ever be, they'll make that available ever in DVD format? I don't think so. I mean, it's certainly possible, but there's a question with rights because 20th Century Fox still owns the rights to the original film and, and all distribution, so Disney can't do that. But even if they, they get it back, I totally believe that because George Lucas was so adamant mm -hmm. about the special editions are now the only authoritative true version of Star Wars, I hate that he did that, but he did that. I have very little doubt that when he was working out the sale deal, for Lucasfilm to Disney, I have very little doubt that he had his lawyers right into that. This is what Star Wars is now. These special editions are Star Wars. You will not re-release blah, 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 any of the old versions because those aren't my movies anymore. These versions of the movies are my movies. And so I have very little doubt that he kind of probably had that written in. How disappointing. How disappointing. <laughs> All right, what's next? Luke Wang Harris writes, Hey Collider, big fan and love the videos. I was wondering if you have heard of anything about Brian Singer's film Uprising that was reported a few months ago. Yeah, Uprising was this very cool, I think it was like in May or something like that. This announcement came out that Brian Singer, who is currently now, you know, putting a bow like in post production on uh, X Men Apocalypse. He, of course, just did X Men: Days of Future Past, and he directed the first two X Men movies, and one of my all time favorite films, The Usual Suspects. Um, he, they announced that he was going to be directing this uprising, which was going to be based on a novel where basically colonists who live on the moon rise up against the people of Earth because mm -hmm. I guess they they are being treated as second class citizens or. Whatever the problem is, there's a problem. There has to be a problem for there to be a movie. Um, and speaking of Flash, you just mentioned, mm -hmm. and Arrow, their creator, Mark Guggenheim, was brought on to write the script for it. However, since that time, Brian Singer came out on his Twitter just about a month ago and said, my next movie is 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. And now we're hearing word, although this has not been officially confirmed yet, but we're hearing word that after 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, he's doing the sequel to X-Men Apocalypse. He's going to be doing the next X-Men film. So where Uprising falls into all this, at this point, I really have no idea. 
I'm not seeing on his IMDb the 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea or Uprising. So do you think because he's already getting ready to do the next X-Men that those projects are just way in the back burner? Uh, no, I de definitely 20,000 Leagues is next. That's absolutely next. Um, and then where Uprising is, I don't know. I hope he does it because it does sound like a fascinating project. Mm -hmm. and, and it's like right up his alley. It's cool sci-fi. I'd be into it. I just don't know what the status is yet. Keep your eyes open. We'll do some digging around. We'll talk about it on Movie Talk when we find some answers. All right, what's next? Christian Miller writes, I've got to say I didn't like the new BVS trailer for the most part. Apart from the beginning sequence, which was mainly good, it seemed to jump around a bit. There wasn't enough Wonder Woman and Doomsday, no, just no. <laughs> I think it was stupid how he's in this movie, especially in this trailer. I would prefer Lex be the main villain, but still keep the movie Batman and Superman centric. Anyways, what are your thoughts, guys? Thanks. Now, I keep Wonder Woman out of it as much as possible. <laughs> uh, and that has nothing to do with Gal Gadot or anything like this. I want this movie to be Batman versus Superman. I don't want it to be Batman versus Superman and Wonder Woman or Batman versus Superman and Wonder Woman and Cyborg and Aquaman and whoever else they can squeeze in there. I'm not interested in that movie yet. So I'm totally cool that they're introducing Wonder Woman. I'm totally cool that we're going to get introduced to Aquaman, but I don't want them. I don't want this to be a three way movie. I want this to be Batman versus Superman. So I have no problem with the lack of Wonder Woman in the trailer. That's fine. Yeah, Doomsday looks stupid. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, that doesn't mean it's going to be stupid, uh, but it just looks stupid, and I didn't like the fact how they introduced him, and that's not who Doomsday is, but whatever. Who knows? Maybe it'll work out great, but I'm just saying I didn't like it in the trailer, much like you didn't like it in the trailer. Um, so there's that as well. As far as Lex Luthor as the main villain, I'm cool with Lex Luthor being the main villain behind the curtain. That's fine, but Lex Luthor isn't going to fight with Batman, and Lex Luthor isn't going to throw down with Superman. So you need something in there that poses a physical threat of some sorts. And to their defense, I mean, Doomsday does that. Absolutely does. i like to see something else do that, but whatever, that works. So, And I do believe Lex Luthor is going to be the main antagonist, but it's going to be a behind-the-curtain thing. But he does need something, some kind of device, to act as a physical threat for Batman and Superman that can both threaten them both and cause the two of them to team up and to hook up. So, um... Yeah, and I'm with you. Some things about the trailer I really loved. Some of the things I thought were disappointing, which is really disappointing to me because the Comic-Con trailer for Batman vs. Superman so good. is still, to me, the best trailer of the year. Better than the Civil War trailer. Better than the Star Wars trailers. And I'm looking forward to Star Wars a lot more, obviously. But I thought that was the best trailer of the year, and I thought it was kind of a weak follow-up effort. A lot of people seems to not like that either how Doomsday look or the yeah. fact that he's going to be in the movie. So is there another uh, villain that you would see in place of that? Maybe Bizarro? Well, a lot of people were hoping for Bizarro. A lot of people were hoping for Brainiac. A lot of hope people were hoping for, I mean, Solomon Grundy might have been an interesting choice too. Uh, a lot of people thought they'd go back to General Zod, something like resurrect General mm -hmm. Zod. Although it looks like their, their version of Doomsday will be kind of be the resurrected yeah, General Zod. It, it looks like that way. I think there's a lot of different directions they could have gone. But, you know, this is, remember, when we're talking about how I don't like that they're doing this and I don't like that they're doing that, let's keep in mind that we're saying we don't like it, and that's fair. But even though I'm saying I don't like it, I'm still leaving room that we're going to watch it in the movie and it's going to work great. So I'm just saying in advance, it, 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 I don't like how they're approaching it and all that kind of stuff. But let's wait and see how it turns out in the film. All right, what's next? Brett Lauf writes, Hello, Collider crew. I have a question about Marvel references inside of the DC television universe. There are a lot of people talking online about how an Avengers reference was in a DC TV show. Does Marvel and DC reference each other, or is it just fans misinterpreting? I'm wondering what you guys' take on this is. Thanks and stay awesome. Yeah, in a recent episode of the... the no, of Arrow. In a mm -hmm. recent episode of Arrow, which was a Flash and Arrow crossover episode, um, the two team, Team Flash and Team Arrow, all show up at this one farmhouse, to which Oliver or Arrow's little sister, known as Speedy, says, huh, a bunch of superheroes hanging out in a farmhouse. I feel like I just saw this. <laughs> and clearly that was a reference to Marvel's Avengers Age of Ultron, which for a good chunk of the movie, the heroes are all standing around in Hawkeye's farmhouse. Um, there is nothing wrong with them making pop cultural references to each other. Now, I don't think DC can come out and say, well, I feel like this is Hawkeye's house. Like, they can't do that. Mm -hmm. But these little nods, these little winks, I think it was more for the audience um, 
the audience's benefit than anything else. And it was funny. It was yeah. funny and it was cute. So yeah, they're totally free to reference each other if they think it'll be fun and funny for the audience. It doesn't hurt anybody and it doesn't help anybody else. It's just cute and fun. So yeah, they did it. And I have no problem that they did it. Do you think with all these you know, different TV shows, Marvel, and now it's on Netflix too, Netflix exclusive Marvel yeah. shows, do you think in the future we'll ever get like a DC Marvel crossover type? You never say never because mm -hmm. after all, they're, they have on a couple of occasions done crossovers in the comics just once again for the fans. They did it as, as, a, as a thing for the fans. And you know, the two brands are not enemies of each other. You have a lot of execs at DC and a lot of execs at Marvel who are actually good friends with each other. Mm -hmm. Never say never, but it's as close to never as possible. Um, you're not going to see Batman show up in an Iron Man movie. You're not going to see Captain America show up in a Superman movie. It's just, it's not going to happen. There are so many pitfalls, landmines, and complications to something like that, that even if the two sides wanted to do it, it would be next to impossible. But just the legalities of it and the red tape they would have to go through and who gets which rights and who's who picks the writer, who picks the director, who whose cast gets the better lines, who shines more, you know, all that kind of stuff. It becomes difficult. And and what but like I said, they did in the comp books, which is a lot, that's a thousand percent <laughs> easier than trying to do in the movies, but they did do it. So never say never, but I just highly Highly doubt that it'll happen. One can only hope. Yep. What's next? Michael Corrigan writes, Hey guys, love the show. I know we've all been excited for In the Heart of the Sea, especially after the release date was moved back for more Oscar consideration. But I just saw that it has a 48 meta score. I generally trust meta score, so I'm surprised and disappointed by this. What say you guys? Have you heard if this film might not be as good as we have all hoped? Thanks and keep on being the best damn movie related show on planet Earth. <laughs> yeah, um, I like meta score. I trust the Rotten Tomato because I like I like what they use to do the measurement on Rotten Tomatoes more than I do on meta score. But it's six one half dozen the other. Um, on Rotten Tomatoes, I believe right now it has like a 60%. It's still a, a, a tomato. It's still considered a good movie. Uh, I saw on for Thursday. Thursday night. Thursday night I saw In the Heart of the Sea, and you saw it too. Mm -hmm. um, and I like the movie. I like it. It is not as good as it could have been though. And it's not as good as the first 30 to 40 minutes of the movie. The first 30 to 40 minutes of the movie are set up as a great movie. And then it just doesn't execute. Look, I'm not going to go into a full review here, and I'm certainly not going to give any spoilers away. But there comes a point when the movie just kind of stops moving, and it just kind of floats the rest of the way. No pun intended. <laughs> it just kind of floats the rest of the way till the movie ends. And you'll see what I mean when you see it. I still enjoyed the film. I, I know you enjoyed yeah, the I film as well. Uh, I still like the film, and I, I'm, I will recommend people go see it, but I will tell people to temper their expectations. It's not the Oscar contender that I think a lot of us were hoping it would be. But still, and I think I think there are some people out there who are writing reviews because, look, this movie did look so, so damn good. And the move to December made it look like it's because the studio had Oscar hopes for it. And there's some very good things about the movie. I think there are some people who are reacting negatively to it online right now because it is a movie that does not live up to its own potential. And the potential for this movie was really, really high. And it doesn't live up to the potential. But I still say it's a good movie. I still enjoyed it. I still had a good time with it. I think most people will. So, um, so yeah, check it out and let us know what you think. What are some of the movies that you would say you really still enjoy, but it was great in Act 1 and Act 2, but kind of fell apart in Act 3? Oh, there are a lot. I find myself at least maybe five or six times a year I, I see films mm -hmm. where it's like that movie's great falls apart at the end like Jack Reacher we were talking about Jack Reacher recently I love I really enjoy Jack Reacher first two acts great granted the third act has problems it kind of falls apart so there and I feel like there are a lot of movies of those come out every year it, it just finishing strong mm -hmm. am I right guys Finishing strong can always be the most <laughs> challenging thing. Yeah, finishing strong can be tough, and the, the true is same in movies as well. You said that about Straight Outta Compton as well. Yeah, Straight Outta Compton was one for me. I Straight Outta Compton, the first two acts of the movie, one of the top three or four movies of the year to me. I felt that the third act got a little convoluted. They lost their way a little bit. Like I said this before in the show. I felt like the first two acts, Straight Outta Compton, laser focus in their direction. Like you just felt that laser focus that they had with uh, uh, Gary Gray mm -hmm. as the director had just pure straight laser focus. And then I felt in the third act, they kind of jumped around a little bit too much. They lost their way. I felt the film lost a little bit of its identity in the third act, but it's so good in the first two acts that it still ends up being a, overall a great movie that I enjoyed thoroughly. That 
scene in that movie, I know I'm going off a tangent here, but that mm-hmm. scene of the Detroit concert oh. is one of my single favorite scenes of the year in any movie. But uh, but yeah, that would be another one where I thought the third act kind of weak as compared mm-hmm. to the first two. But the first two were still so strong. Still ends up being a really good movie. Well, I hope the low score doesn't deter people from seeing it because I think it's a great film. Yeah. All right. What's next? Ryan Kobe writes, I have enjoyed your recent commentary videos on Star Wars movies and would love to see these movie commentaries continue. Your opinions and insights are of great value and wonderfully entertaining. Please consider. Thanks. I don't know if we have very many insights. <laughs> um, we're, we're, sitting around, in show. we're sitting around stuffing chicken into our faces, <laughs> eating turkey sandwiches and chips and drinking and guzzling whatever. I, you know what? Here's the thing. We, we never made these videos, these commentary videos, to give you, the viewer, our incredible insight into what is happening. Notice the juxtaposition of, no, no, that, that was never what it was meant to be. It was meant to be videos that we hope that give you an excuse to sit down with these movies and it, feel like you're sitting down and watching it with a group of buddies. And that's what we want these videos to be. Because there's nothing I like more than sitting down with a group of buddies and watching movies. And if we can do that and talk through it and just have some fun watching the movies and then you get to kind of cue that up and watch it with it. And we kind of hope that it it's like all of us. We It's like we get to sit down with you and you get to sit down with us and we're watching the movie together. So, yeah, it's not like we're not so <laughs> ridiculous or pompous to think we are going to share our deep insight into this theatrical motion picture. No, it's about us just having fun as movie fans watching these movies. And hopefully you have some fun with us as we're doing it. Um, it's funny you asked that question because as we were recording uh, Revenge of the Sith, or after we were finished recording Revenge of the Sith, me and, and Schnepp and Mark and Christian were sitting around. It's like, you know what? We got to do more of these. Even once the Star Wars ones are done. So I'm thinking like maybe once a month. We're just going to like whether it's the Matrix or whether it's Zoolander or whether it's, you know, something else. Like once a month we'll pick a DVD sit down, have some fun, order some pizza, watch it, and then uh, hopefully, you know, make it like we get to watch it with you guys. So we will be doing them. Would you want to do a commentary on The Room? Oh, my God. <laughs> I hadn't even thought of that. Um, you know what? If we put up a poll on Twitter and people say they want The Room, then we'll do The Room. Oh I got God. a feeling some people would rather see some other things, but if people want The Room, we'll do The Room. <laughs> All right, what's next? Matt Shalman writes, Greetings and salutation, Collider folks. Love listening to your podcast during my lone trek to and from work every day. My question is, why do the good movies from Marvel, Star Wars, DC, and etc. that are guaranteed great box office success show a lot of great scenes in their respective trailers? Though I watch the previews anyways, as they are hard to avoid with social media and going to the movies, I often get I often get mad that they show an amazing scene like how Wonder Woman arrives in Batman v Superman or the Stormtrooper being able to kick more butt now. Hmm. What are your thoughts and does this bother you? Well, look, we will often say Star Wars is guaranteed to make uh, is always guaranteed to make be a big hit. OK, yeah, but Lucasfilm isn't interested in Star Wars being a billion dollar movie. They're interested in Star Wars being a $1.5 billion movie. You know, Marvel's not interested in Captain America Civil War being a $900 million movie. They're interested in being in a $1.6 billion movie. And so while we can sit back and say, hey, man, like like a lot of us even joke, like you don't even need trailers for Star Wars and it's going to make money. That's true. You don't even need trailers for Star Wars and it would make money. But it wouldn't make a shitload of money. And that's that's what studios are interested in. That's oh, what movie was that from? Spaceballs. So it's not a lot of money. It's a shitload of money. I mean, that's that's what the studios are interested in. And like, yes, um, you know, uh, Batman v Superman, Civil War, Star Wars: Force Awakens. These are films that are guaranteed to be blockbuster hits. But the studio doesn't want just blockbuster hits from those films. They want mega blockbuster hits. And putting out these trailers, and you know, I'm sure they've got studies and whatever that kind of help guide. I I still think the Batman v Superman trailer was a mistake, but I got excited seeing Finn pull out the lightsaber and the stormtrooper pull out that looked like some kind of a force lance or something. Yeah, uh, what's not really like like a vibro staff or something, and they're gonna fight with that. I got intrigued by that. They, it's not about appealing to the hardcore movie fans. It's about appealing to the average cinema goer who may or may not be going to see Star Wars. You know, those are the ones they got to appeal to, and that's why they make these trailers. That's why they have these marketing campaigns. Because once again, they're not interested in a billion dollar movie. They're interested, and they'll have parties if they make a billion dollars for sure. But they want it to make more than that. They want to get every penny out of this that they can, and that's where the marketing comes in. 
I agree with you. I think uh, showing these amazing scenes, they want to whet your appetite just a little bit before you go in, for, especially for the general audience. But do you think there's ways to avoid if you're a hardcore fan you don't want to see? No. I mean, that's, that's just the thing now. Like you can, I've got friends who have told themselves and who told me months ago, I'm not going to watch any Star Wars trailers. Like they saw the first one that came out a year ago, last, last uh, December. They said, I'm not going to watch any more Star I'm so, I'm not going to watch any more. It's just fine, but you can't. You can't avoid it. It's on every Twitter feed. It's in every Facebook profile page. It's, it's constantly on television. It's in front of the movies you go to watch. It's bombarding us. And even if you somehow lucked out in a way to really avoid them, man, I don't know if you can resist. I don't know that you can resist if you're a real Star Wars fan. I mean, mm. I mean, you can if you got really solid, strong, like stronger will than me. Uh, but, I, it's it's tough when the new one drops and everybody's raving about it. You're like, oh, okay, I'll watch that one or whatever. But it's even if you don't want to, it is tricky to avoid them. Like I didn't want to know certain spoilers about Sons of Anarchy or whatever else, and I found them out not because I looked for them, but because they came and hit me over the head. Thank you very much, social media. <laughs> It is really, really hard to avoid all. I'm, I'm trying to avoid like death, all the Star Wars. The <laughs> only other ones I've seen is the international one. Yes, which is hard, a hard one to avoid. Yeah. All right, last question of the day. All right, Adam Yates writes, Lately there has been a lot of speculation that Chris Pratt would take up the Indiana Jones role for the next movie. Now that ain't happening, would you like to see Pratt given a new franchise in the same genre, maybe a film of the Uncharted games and cast him as Nathan Drake? What are your thoughts? Um, you know, it's one of those things that always comes up. Like, would you like to... S- Pardon me. Would you like to see this actor in this role? It's like, I'd like to see he's a good actor. I'd like to see him in any role. Or it's a role, put any good actor in there. That's fine. So Nathan, yeah, he would be a fit for Nathan Drake. I'd be good for that. Sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, so would 15 other actors. Sure. Uh, would we like to see Chris Pratt given another franchise? Well, he just was. I mean, he was just given the Jurassic World franchise. Now, like the biggest movie, you know, biggest opening ever, one of the biggest films of all time. So he's now kind of, he's got two major blockbuster franchises now going, the Jurassic World ones and Guardians of the Galaxy. So he's got that going on. He's got another one called, I can't remember who he's in it with, but it's like they're, it's a sci-fi film. They're on like a 40-year journey to another planet, but he accidentally wakes up out of hyper sleep and he, so he wakes somebody else up so he doesn't be alone for the next 20 years during the flight. I can't remember the name of the movie, he but- uh, Magnificent. Seven and Passengers. Passengers, thank you. That's that's it, it's Passengers. So he's got that one coming up as well. So you're going to see Chris Pratt get a lot offered to him in the next like two years or so. Do you think he's going to start being able to break away a little bit from these action-y Indiana Jones type Well, I roles? mean, he's already got some credits. Look, if you look at him... Um, he was in Moneyball, mm-hmm. and that while well, he had a Joker too, he was, it was kind of a dramatic role. It was a dramatic role in uh, Zero Dark Thirty. It was actually even a dramatic role. His character was more of a straight character in that one he just did with Vince Vaughn called that comedy where Vince Vaughn found out he has a hundred children. I can't remember the name of it. It's probably not that Delivery important. Delivery Man. Delivery Man. Thank you. Uh, in Delivery Man, so he has already a track record of playing different kinds of roles, and that's cool. Mm-hmm. But his big successful stuff will always be Chris Pratt playing Chris Pratt because Chris Pratt is so entertaining yeah. and he's so fun to watch and he's so engaging. And in person, believe me when I tell you, he's the same way. He's that fun, lovable, likable guy in person that he is on TV and that's his main money maker. So I think you're going to see him do a lot of different types of roles. I think Passengers will be one of those different kinds of movies, yeah. but I think you're going to see him have his biggest success and people loving him the most when he's playing what he's beloved playing. So I think we're going to see a lot of that. All right, folks, I'll do it for this installment of Mailbag. Thank you so much for joining us. Listen, the most important part of these shows is not what I have to say or anybody else has to say. It's what you have to say. Jump into the comment section. Leave your thoughts, your opinions, your theories, your philosophies, whatever, in the comments section below. I want to thank my co-host today, Miss Wendy Lee. Wendy, where can people find you online? Thanks for having me again. Uh, you can find me on Twitter or Instagram at Wendy Lee Zaney. And uh, you can follow me on Facebook or on Twitter simply at John Campia. That'll do it for us, guys. Thanks so much for joining us this weekend. We'll be back tomorrow with Movie Talk, our Monday edition. Make sure you come back and join us then. So until then, bye-bye.